Hello, everyone. Thank you for all for, for being here. We, we clearly need a bigger room for the future. <laughs> so uh, welcome to this exciting panel uh, session on how to shape uh, future-proof newsrooms. Uh, I'm Ezra Eman. I'm the change director at Media House, looking at how we prepare our newsrooms for the next decades. And I'm honored to be joined by a fantastic, uh, three inspiring thinkers in the field of media and journalism. And now comes the difficult part. I have to pronounce all of their names correctly. So next to me, there is Sophie Witvet. Yes. Uh, head of media at the Copenhagen Institute of Future Studies, an independent nonprofit futures think tank. She's strongly engaged in the intersection between media, technology, and entertainment, and has a background in media industry, among others, DR and the Danish uh, Media Board. Next to her, there is Agnes Stenbon, founder and head of InLab, a joint innovation lab of Shipstead and the Tinius Trunt, focusing on how we can use new technologies to meet news outsiders. She also is a PhD candidate in AI journalism at the Copenhagen Royal Institute of Technology. And then finally, we have Shirish Kulkarni, journalist, researcher, and community organizer focused on innovation and inclusion. He's currently embarking on a two-year project partnership with the BBC, looking at how we can tell different stories in different ways to meet the needs of people and communities who don't currently see any value in our journalism. So we're going to talk about uh, newsrooms and news organizations and how they can adopt uh, a future mindset. And this talk very much came together because Sophie and Agnes, we saw each other in London at another conference at the end of last year. And the topic of that conference was the metaverse and NFTs, remember? <laughs> and uh, already at that point we were feeling uh, that's not really going to happen anytime soon. And there was the, the first buzz of generative AI was around. And we all felt it's happening so fast. It's very difficult for us to keep up and to think about the future and uh, potential transformation of, of, of our newsrooms and, and the impact of these technologies. And we felt that that thinking was not necessarily widely shared across our newsrooms. Uh, so day-to-day -day headlines are very much on top of mind. The pressure for revenue tends to push away long-term perspectives in newsrooms and, and, and these considerations. So that's why we are here, to see how we can bridge between the operational now and the future, to understand how we might adopt a future mindset uh, and how thinking about tomorrow is actually something that you have to do today, uh, as well as some hands-on approaches on how do you get that future mindset in your newsroom. So but without further ado, I want to maybe start with uh, Sophie, because I would like to, uh, Sophie to kick things off. She's thinking about the future, and that's her main job. So I hope you can introduce us a bit into a kind of a framework for us to understand the future. Thank you very much, and thank you for that introduction. And, and I'm truly honored to be sitting at this table because these are amazing people, really some change agents of uh, the Future Newsroom. And I guess you are too, since you're here. So thank you so much for coming and uh, investigating a little bit into the, the possible futures. And so I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes talking a little bit about how we work with the futures and how we ensure that we have this futures mindset and work structured with the future. Because I think that's the main issue, actually, that if we do not work with it in a structured way, it just becomes narratives that you cannot put back into play in your organization, in the strategies and in the products or services that you're delivering. So that's also something that we really try to do. But let's start. So when does, this, when does the future start? You said it starts tomorrow. When do you think? When is the future? Well, okay. <laughs> There's something called group fallacy, so that people thinking the same way, maybe we should work on that. What we really want to try to do at the Institute is to try to stretch our mindsets, you know, have a little bit more mental flexibility, and we cannot do that if we think about the future in the now. Then we are too close to this sort of path-dependent thinking, right? We're too close to the now, so even though the technology is moving so fast, it's accelerating so fast, even then, we have to try to detach to the now in order to really truly embrace the possible futures. So we work with this framework, and most of you probably have heard about the cone of futures uh, before, this futures cone. Um, so we have the present uh, moment, right? And then we have the possible futures. And the longer you move into this cone, the more possible futures we see. So when we dive into this cone, we dive into the high uncertainties like, let's say, how will acceptance of AI be in society? That is a huge uncertainty, and we do not know how that will go. So the further out you go there, the more scenarios we can build upon that. So we tend to try and work in, within the field of the plausible futures uh, and the probable futures, but there are also 
of course, very, a lot amount of, of possible futures and wildcards suddenly coming in. I would say chat GPT, even though we knew the technology was coming, it sort of com came in and disrupted a lot of things, right? As did COVID, uh, as did the war in Ukraine. So there are many things that can come in and change how we think about the world and, and, and suddenly make everything different, right? So this is what we work with. We work with structuring the narratives and the scenarios of the possible futures and really opening our mindset. So when you are a traditional, let's say, strategist that are working a lot on data, and we do that in the media industry as well, we look at how many users, you know, do we have any KPIs that can support this? We're standing in the now, in the tactical, where we have more data and more evidence and more certainty. The further we move into the future, the less certainty we have. And that's where we are trying to position ourselves. And I would also say that the other people in this uh, table really trying to go to the future and then see how, can, how will these possible futures look and how can we take that back to the now? Because that expands our mindset and our way of looking creativity, you know, more, more, more creatively into the possible futures, right? And this is definitely something that is needed at this moment with so many big uncertainties shaping the future of journalists and the future of journalism. So. My last quote before I leave it on to you, Agnes. In times of change, the learners will inherit the world while the knowers will be beautifully equipped for a world that no longer exists. Thank you, Sophie. And I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a great framework. And I think, Agnes, if I'm right, you're using this framework at INLAP. Eh? You, how do you apply it? We are, and I'm happy to, to share a little bit. So just briefly, Ezra mentioned that I founded and run a team called InLab, a joint venture between Shipstead and the Tinius Trust. And what we're here to do is to prototype news futures for current news outsiders. So in essence, what we are trying to do is to understand lived pain points in communities, audiences that we're not reaching today, to then inform future, mainly technological experimentation and how we could reach them in the future. So a little bit different from Sophie, maybe, we're actually quite concerned or interested in the now because we think we need to understand the now to navigate our way forward. But I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, but just um, for context as in why we founded InLab, I think it's useful for you to know that I come from an AI background. So I used to be the product manager for machine learning at Shipstead. I ran the AI strategy for Shipstead and did uh, risk assessment for the group. And it's kind of with that lens, we also now want to tackle uh, one of the big challenges for journalism at this point of time, news outsidership or news avoidance, as some people frame it. But I won't talk about that today. I won't talk about uh, the way that we used to cone. So we're a dedicated team in a big group. Shipstead runs runs national news destinations in Sweden and Norway, but we're deliberately separated from those news organizations. It's really hard to rethink the fourth estate if you're doing the work of the fourth estate. So we're separate, and we're here to imagine the possible futures. So our work and our experimentation isn't always leading us to preferred futures, scenarios that we want to pursue, but we're here to explore where we could go, what the possible opportunities are. As I said, we think that it's really important to anchor that work in the now, to understand lived pain points, lived realities in communities that we want to serve in the future. So we always start our work by empathizing with a specific group of news outsiders that we want to reach in a possible future. And then we use insights from that very social work to try to explore where we could go. We ask questions to the audience, work with that group uh, to see what their lived reality looks like and what their possible preferred futures might be. So we're a team of uh, social technical skilled people. It's uh, democracy inclusion specialists, NLP specialists, really trying to combine social and technical work. One project that we ran uh, that I'd want to just give us an example of how we do this in practice, uh, how we bring social technical processes to life is the News Changemaker program. So this is a co-creative speculative design process that we ran last year where we focused on a specific group of news outsiders, young people, 16 to 19, living in outer city Stockholm, a crime-ridden area where trust in social institution is much lower than the national average, consumption of and trust in news media much lower than the national average. So we wanted to work with a group from this community to see what are their pain points and what would their preferred future look like? So we hired 10 people, 10 young adults, for a paid 10-week co-creation process, the News Changemaker program, where these young adults were tasked with 
both sharing insights about the now, but more importantly, expanding our perspectives about where we could go in the future, the possibilities of the future. I could talk forever about what we learned in this program, uh, and I would be happy to do that, but today I'll just settle with sharing a quote that I think summarizes pretty well why we wanted to do this program. So, after touring our newsrooms, one of our participants said that everybody here looks like their name is Karen or Peter. He wasn't wrong. Most of us are called Karen or Peter. My middle name is Karen. Uh, <laughs> But we wanted to see what would happen if that wasn't the case. What would happen to journalism if we brought new voices in, not just in a research interview, but in an actual design and innovation process? What if the news would be different if we invited more perspectives in? We shared all of the insights of this program on a public domain, so you can go check that out at a later point, but I'll just briefly say that uh, by doing that, by inviting our critics in, we definitely got uh, some serious uh, radical innovation into our newsrooms. These young adults, they innovated concepts like an AI-driven news therapist, a product that puts the mental health of consumers at the very top. They also had some more concepts that were more straightforward. What if the news was music? And what if AI helped us generate it? The ideas here are not necessarily our preferred future. They're not necessarily the products that we will be building tomorrow, but they're helping us as an organization explore where we could go and then make informed decisions about which path we actually want to embark on and which audience we want to cater to in that possible future. Just, you ended with a quote, I'll end with a tagline. Um, the thing that we've learned so far from doing this work is that if we want to truly innovate and truly see different futures for journalism, diversity of perspectives is an absolute necessity. You could see it as a CSR project if you want to, but to us, this is essentially a product and business essential. We won't be building products that are relevant and engaging for the future consumers unless we actually bring their perspectives into our innovation processes. Invite your critics in, invite radical new perspectives, and. I'm, sure that your newsroom is going to end up with some quite different ideas than if we would have just thought the people in this room to yeah, the table. I, I think that's a perfect bridge also to Shirish because I, I remember the conversation that we had uh, yesterday. You said that the, the future cone is not necessarily neutral because it assumes that there's like a shared starting point and maybe there are different starting points to, to take in consideration. So maybe Shirish you can give us a bit, a bit of a background uh, on that idea. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think I'm going to leave this up for a second because in a way this is a really neat segue to, because I agree, Agnes and Sophie and Ezra, I agree on almost everything, but um, it's a really neat segue into kind of my views on this because I think my tagline, and I haven't got it on the slides, is actually the future of journalism cannot look the same as the past. And that sounds obvious, but look at the journalism now compared to the journalism of 30 years ago. Is it really any different? We have the inverted pyramid because the telegraph existed, because it was expensive, it was unreliable, and so people put information in, in the top of the, the story. Technology has moved on 15 generations since then, but yet we still cling to those habits and formulas. And the reason for that is there is not diversity of perspective in our newsrooms. In a way, I talk about how innovation, for example, is a driver of inclusion. The re I'm, everyone else here is much younger than me. I'm 52 years old, and generally it's not the old people who are thinking kind of future-wise. But I have to think outside the box because I was never allowed inside the box. We have to find workarounds. People who are marginalized in society, particularly in the journalism industry, have to think outside the box. So the future of journalism, the people in it, frankly, cannot look the same as the past. And that's why, for me, it's also about being interdisciplinary and thinking more broadly, because actually, Agnes and I are actually, in a way, sort of reasonably unique in the journalism industry because we both work deeply in community engagement and we both work around AI and machine learning. And actually, generally in the industry, people do one 
or the other. I mean, not that many people do community engagement, frankly, but people do one or the other. They're seen as binaries, but the future has to be multidisciplinary and actually involve really wide thought. I mean, I actually spoke to someone pretty senior in participatory audience research at the BBC yesterday, and she talked about how actually the management in the BBC don't really listen to what they say. And it's like, you're paying them, but actually you're not listening to them because you don't really believe it. And that's because there's this snobbishness around journalism, which, as you know, journalism is the answer to everything. So what does that look like? So actually what we talk about a lot is the definition of journalism even in the future, as being embedded in the workflows of today. So this is a near future project that I worked on, what some people call modular journalism. And what this is, is essentially saying the one-to-many article, so if, you were in, if you're in the UK, like my context, someone in the BBC sitting in London writing an article that's supposed to meet the needs of everyone in the world. It's nonsensical, right? When you say it out loud... It doesn't make any sense, but that's what we do. That's journalism. So actually, this is an infinite number of stories that can be produced to meet infinite number of needs from a set of simple modules of journalism. But actually, what's crucial in these, you won't be able to see it massively, but you can look it up on my website, massive plug, but it's the questions we're asking. So in there are basic things like what's important, what happened, but also is any community disproportionately or particularly affected, for example? What's the solution to this? What comes next? These are questions we don't ask in journalism. The far future is this. So talking about uh, Anderson's sort of speculative futures, I actually worked on a massive arts project in the UK last year. And we worked with Alex McDowell, who some of you may know was the production designer for the film Minority Report. So we worked with him and communities across Wales, where I live, for them to imagine the future of 2052, to connect them with the present. People cried because no one had ever asked them what they thought the future should look like. That's the diversity of perspective. They're not the people who are generally asked. So I'll come back to my tagline. The future of journalism can't look like the present and certainly not like the past. Yeah, thank you, Shiri. So that's a very important perspective, and I hope we can uh, um, elaborate on that during, during our conversation. I, I, I want to add a, a little bit uh, to the conversation, um, share a bit of, of our approach within Media House and in how we work with the future. It's by all means not a comprehensive uh, overview, but I thought you might want to go away from here with a few tools in your back. And uh, in terms of future-proofing our newsrooms, and I hope this clicker works, it all starts with a first key question, who do we want to be? It's, it's, it has to start from your identity. Who do you want to be now and who do you want to be in the future? And in our case, it's very clear that we want to maintain our journalistic mission. That's providing independent journalism, safeguarding the diversity and the, the diversity of our specific brand voices that we have and being locally relevant. With this in mind, the next question then becomes, how do you do this in a fast changing landscape and an uncertain future? And we have three uh, uh, approaches that I want to share. The first one is a strategic one. The second one is a bit more a product de development oriented one. And then the final one works on culture and mindsets. So the first one is backcasting. And actually, it's a reinversion of the future cone. Rather than starting from the present and imagining future scenarios, you already pick a scenario and you work your way back. And this is something that we do at the highest level of our organization. And an example scenario could be the end of print by 2030. It's not something that we want. It's certainly something that we need to prepare for. So by putting this as a very extreme future out there, it forces us to think about the actions that we need to take to cope with that possible event. Because a paperless scenario is one where we wouldn't have any print advertising, we wouldn't have any print subscription income anymore, and it would challenge us as an organization. So the exercise is about then defining steps prioritizing steps that you can take to close that income gap. Digital revenue growth, operational efficiency, new value propositions, acquisitions, partnerships, investing in new technologies, 
The good thing about this exercise is that it really forces you to leave your comfort zone in order to meet that future scenario. The second approach is much more a product workflow oriented one, and I call it applying lenses. A good example for this is the current acceleration of AI. How will it shape the way we work and deliver value? And as a change director for news, my main focus is there on our newsrooms. And as a starting point, and so their starting point is the newsroom workflow from sourcing to publishing. But in order to understand how we might apply AI, we have to break away from seeing it pure as a substitute for existing work. So that's why the three specific lenses come to, to mind. The first one is an obvious one, we automate. Where can AI be used to substitute work efficiency or create extra value by automating existing tasks and workflows? And, and we do that by automating our metadata, which is a very uh, laborsome uh, kind of duty that can be automated quite easily. Transcription integration into our CMS, so don't type every uh, interview yourself, but have that transcribed automatically in your CMS. That's a, an example of uh, automation. In terms of augmenting, uh, where can AI be used to augment what we do and add value beyond current tasks and workflows? And a, a good example of, of that within Media House is our article DNA project. It's kind of intelligent analysis of our content, looking at user needs, uh, topics, perspectives, uh, and more, in order to better understand our content mix, to be able to better commission, to better plan and promote our content across uh, our channels and across user needs as well. And then a second example there is we're currently researching a headline prediction uh, engine that will be able to suggest multiple headlines depending on, on the kind of uh, channels that we want to play it out on and predict conversion and engagement scores. And again, that's something that adds that extra layer that we wouldn't have uh, in our normal workflow. And then finally, it's about transformation. Where can AI transform what we do and give and shape shape something new and, and something unexpected that we're currently not able to do. Uh, a, a really beautiful example there is Rhetoric AI. It is a, a kind of new commenting module that we have on some of our websites and that's uh, rethinking how commenting works. So rather than commenting as a mere reaction, it, is, it becomes an intelligent dialogue. It kind of educates the person that does the, the comment. And if you're too toxic or if you're too short in your answers, it will say, don't you think this is a bit short? Don't you want to elaborate on this? It gives you different perspectives. So you, it, gave, it takes you through different steps to come to better commenting. And then finally, I really like the, the, the idea of collaborative reporting between the audience and AI. A really beautiful example of that was the, the Wild Garden. That was a project at NRC, one of our Dutch titles, where they crowdsourced how nature would uh, uh, grow if you, live, if you leave it alone for like uh, a year in a one square, square meter of your garden. And that was documented by all of the readers with a smartphone that had an AI application that would see what kind of plants would then grow in those gardens. And that's something you can only do by massively bringing that AI in and that data in. And that's a really interesting new way of, of, of uh, actually uh, bringing journalism in, in, into the fold. And then finally, my final approach is something that you can start doing now. It is what we call our Newsroom Makers Week, and that is prototyping your future strategy already now with your newsrooms. It's so important to bring your product department and your newsrooms department together, focusing on the exploration of new capabilities, but with a very pragmatic end goal. We want that output that is something that we can put on our uh, roadmap and that then afterwards becomes a tangible kind of token of what you've done together. And it's not so much about uh, the output of that sprint needs to be tangible. People need to feel that they've contributed to something, but it's also about infusing that future mindset and bringing everybody up to speed and, and, and everybody thinking about products and about the future. So that was, in a nutshell, three kind of approaches that we at Media House uh, uh, apply. But after the four perspectives or the three perspectives from, from, from media side, I, I wonder, Sophie, are we on the right track? <laughs> Wow, we <laughs> you the, here at the table definitely on the right track and on the trying to understand and grasp this and also I think uh, what was being talked about regarding predictions or you know having being prepared 
because what you are trying to do at your newsroom, what you are trying to do with the in-lab, what you are trying to doing, do with your projects is to prepare for the plausible and possible futures. So that's what we need. That kind of mindset is so needed. And there is no right or wrong way to work with the future such, as such. Uh, of course, I don't, we don't really like to work so much with utopian dystopian views because we believe that that is a... Uh, it's a dangerous path to take and not a very good one in order to work with the possible futures. So diving more into the uncertainties and looking into that and then of course identifying preferable futures and try to see how can we go there. But I mean, in, when it comes to frameworks, you know, we have tons of different methods and a lot of different futurists have other methods and there are none that are necessarily better than the other in the sense it's all about opening our mindsets, being more creative and, and, and understanding that journalism of today will not be the same when it comes to the future. So don't worry, I mean, it will not be the same. Will it be better? That's the, that's the big issue, right? Or will it be worse? So how do we ensure the better of journalism? And I really, I don't know if any of you were lucky to attend the session that was next door. I'm not sure that kind of could fit about AI in the newsroom. There was a comment being made by Semaphore, one of the new news um, actors from, from um, US. And um, it was said that so it's not about saving journalists, it's about saving, saving journalism. And I really think we need to have the focus back on who, is, who are we actually here for. We are here for the audiences. And I know you're going to talk much more about that. So to answer your question very shortly, yes, you are. But the news industry really needs to understand that this is something urgent that we have to, to work on and figure out how mm. to, to figure out in your own organization how you will fit into the possible futures. But I think that's such a, um, it's a good quote. It's about journalism, not journalists. And I think that's why the topic of futures is one that's inherently collaborative. It's not about one organization thriving or uh, getting the most subscribers, but it's about the shared function that we're all here in Perugia to, to learn more about and to um, evolve together. Um, it's about that thriving in a future. Um, so I think it's, wonderful to see so many people involved in open discussions about futures of journalism. And I think we'll, we'll need more of that. We'll definitely need a bigger room next year uh, because we're all in it. It's uh, not just the brand, but a function. Jerish, you work with the BBC. Do you feel like that's a big organization? Do you feel that there's an openness to, to reconsider the, the starting point? I think so. I mean, I think part of the problem is that, well, I think what the BBC has and what public service broadcasts have a little bit of, but probably not enough of, is a values perspective and, in a way, that long-term perspective. Because who here hasn't been to a session which mentioned chat GPT or a generative AI here? Like, no one, right? So everyone's chasing that thing right now. But things come along, right? Things come along. Last year it was TikTok, this year it's generative AI. It'll be something else next year and the year after that. We can't go chasing things in that short-termist way that's largely driven by cost or time pressures. Mm -hmm. Actually, what we need to really address the future is a long-term perspective of what we want to do, who we want to be, why we want to be mm -hmm. those things. And then if the technology or the innovation fits into that, great. But otherwise, we end up getting pulled in multiple different directions and never getting to the future we want because we've got lost in the maze on the way. So I think really everyone needs to be approaching it with a what are our values, what do we want to be, what do we want to be for our users, our viewers, our readers, our audiences. And I think that's sometimes the thing that gets lost, particularly in a time of technological change. And probably why the journalism now is not different from the way it was 30 years ago. Yeah. I mean, if you look at um, you know, online journalism, is really just putting newspaper articles on the web, right? It's not much different from that. We have so many storytelling tools, but actually we got pulled into, oh, we're doing this, or we're doing that, we're doing Twitter, we're doing Facebook, you know, then the algorithm changes, then we're not doing Facebook, we're not doing Twitter, you know, or, uh, you know Elon Musk takes over Twitter. So it's like having that long-term values perspective. Agnes, how do you see, within Chips as well, the transfer between what you're doing at the InLab and the bigger mothership? Like, uh, how do you see that transfer happening? Is that, is that a smooth process, or do you need to use your elbows a bit? <laughs> um, so what we do is um, 
mostly speculative work. So again, it's not necessarily desirable things that we build. Um, but I do feel like the ideas that come from our work and the tangible prototypes that we build um, are welcome in the newsroom in ways that I was not expecting. I was expecting to have to use my elbows a bit more. Um, but I, I feel like there's a sense of urgency um, and a shared um, want and need to, to innovate. And nobody knows exactly what it is that we need to do, but we all know that it's not what we're doing now. Um, so I feel welcome. But I have to say that I think it's really important that as a big organization, so Ship said 6,000 employees, lots of different brands, we'd have the resources to have more than one innovation team. And I think it's really important to not frame future thinking and innovation as something that's dedicated in one confined space. This is the innovation team. They're the guys wearing cool t-shirts. But r rather build it as a culture across all functions. And then I think it's really important that we do both near-term and long-term future planning. So we're long-term, we're speculative. We're building products like an AI-driven music service. Not something that I'm sure many of you would want to consume, but maybe something somebody in our future would want. But we also have teams much closer, kind of anchored in the current product and trying out new opportunities in our current products. So we're building things like um, AI-driven summaries, we're doing things like synthetic voice cloning, things that are implemented here and now, creating value in new ways. And I think that's really important to have a mix so that futures aren't just speculative or just close to now, but both. I think that's the way to yeah. set uh, the culture for us. Uh, an often heard critique, uh, uh, Sophie, is that the future never is the way that we predict it. So why would we even try to build scenarios? How do you prevent that kind of thinking blocking the, the, the exercise that's needed? So the, the the reason that we really need to also, I, I to, totally agree that we need to be all the places on that cone and, and, and having also an understanding of where we are at that cone, but also creating a common language of what are the, the big uncertainties that we need to address. Because if you do not talk about it, then you'll walk around with different views of the future and maybe working towards different futures as well. Uh, and that's a total mess uh, <laughs> in, the, in the sense of um, ensuring that you have that in your strategy and then you sort of combine it back. So ensuring that people understand that, yes, these are narratives. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. I do not do predictions, right? We do sort of, we can say something is more plausible, and I know we're going to go to that a little bit later. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to ask you that right now, because <laughs> yeah. I, I think some people in the room might want to hear what you think about, is, is a plausible scenario for the future for media? What are some of the, the big signs that will influence how we yeah, produce and, and distribute and connect with our audiences? and, and and obviously there are many answers to that because there are so many uncertainties and we need to dive into it. And for each of your organizations, though it, it looks different, the different uncertainties, right? There are, of course, some broader societal, like what will media look like? And those are the things that we dive into, but also how will that then affect your organization, right? But So I write columns also um, about the possible futures and we work a lot into these different narratives. So the latest column that I wrote on the future of news media uh, in sort of talking about AI as well, I'll just quickly read for you a, a, a deep ill uh, translated version of my Danish article. So this is completely translated by Deep L. So if you don't get it, then blame Deep L. How many of you know Deep L? All right, so Deep L is like a Google Translate, just a better version. That's the, sorry, Google. <laughs> uh, anyway, so <clears throat> we're, not here, we're not here to promote anybody. Um, anybody from Google here? <laughs> no, never mind. Okay, so imagine, so now, whew, imagine that we are in 2030. The internet is overflowing with content, and virtually all content on the internet, more than 99%, is created using artificial intelligence and machine learning. The media landscape has completely changed. Finding and keeping track of news is no longer something you have to deal with yourself on different news platforms. Your personal digital assistant handles everything for you by curating the most relevant news based on your interests and your contexts that you are in. Selected paid digital assistants have an automatic fact-checking feature that compares sources to ensure the authenticity of the content and flags potential misinformation for the more educated part of the users. The made by human labeling scheme is used in the, U in the EU to declare content that is more than 50% crafted by verified content producers. 
but it represents only a fraction of the content you would normally receive in your feed unless you subscribe specifically to human-made, journalistically processed and curated content. However, more and more people are no longer prioritizing human-created news and are opting out because if you can't afford curation, the news flow seems un uh, unmanageable. The battle for attention has become all-consuming. So curation becomes something you afford. How, how, what's your reaction on, on, on this, uh, Shirish? Well, so, I mean, I think it's, it's all true. Um, <laughs> like, like, <laughs> where it's, like, it's all true. It's, I think what, what my response to that is, is actually that's the way we should be thinking. Like, actually, the conversation is about, you know, oh, they're coming for our jobs, right? But actually, the problem is lo lots of journalism is formulaic. Right? Lots of journalism isn't about the craft. So actually, what do we do? Like, lots of that journalism can be done perfectly well, and it is being done perfectly well by AI and machine learning already. So what are the journalists of the future? And they are human beings. So we need to lean into the things which make us uniquely human, which machines can't do. So that is connection, collaboration, care, facilitation, right? All those things, which arguably journalism should be much more about right now, but probably isn't. But actually, we are going to need to lean into that stuff in the future, because otherwise there won't be jobs, because there probably shouldn't be jobs doing that formulaic journalism. So actually, it's leaning into that humanness. The other thing I wanted to say is like when Anya's talked about you know, the people in the cool T-shirts, is we need to lean into innovation that isn't cool. And what I mean by that is who here is thinking really deeply about accessibility? Because we have all got aging populations, right? That is not cool. That's largely not the things which wins awards or your manager says, let's do something cool. But it is the thing which is going to give you an audience in back, yeah. And that goes back to the diversity of perspectives. And I think, I mean, accessibility is an obvious uh, need and, and right, but it's also a vehicle to just building better products. Not just for the people who might necessarily need the accessibility feature, but to get us in the newsroom and in the news organizations to start thinking in new ways. So I mentioned a synthetic cloned voice that we do at Chipstat. And that's not a project that came because somebody thought it was cool with text-to-speech. It's a project that came because we have a growing dyslectic population in Norway. How do we make sure that the news are understandable and um, kind of more easily and readily available to all people in our population? What if text-to-speech could be a way to do that? And then that kind of started a snowball effect where we're now catering to lots of different users with that specific innovation. Yeah. So I think... Accessibility, great, we should do it, but we should also see it as something that really spurs innovation kind of broadly. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, actually, if you're, like, the average reading age in the UK is nine. So can a nine-year-old read a BBC News article? Probably not. So what we're saying is, and I don't mean just the BBC, I mean, you know, across all... So actually, what we're saying is we're ruling out half our audience before we've even started... Yeah. And by making it more accessible, easier to read, we're making it better for everyone. And no one's talking about that. Yeah. We, we, had, we had the conversation mm. yesterday because I said the, the other part of that is that actually the population in Europe is growing older. And there will be a, 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 a population that will need some accessibility features as well. And that might mm. be, well, your existing audience that you need to adapt to in the future. And that's, that's maybe uh, also something that we ignore mm. too much. And I will throw in the metaverse here. I know, it, you know we don't talk about the metaverse anymore, but uh, I did a talk at, uh, at South By it's about meta washing. This whole idea that we're all thinking, oh, it didn't do what it was supposed to do. The metaverse is not here yet, okay? It might be here in a very, very you know, small things, but this is still something that will affect the experience because you talk about reading the news. You talk about listening to the news, experiencing the news. We talk about how can we do accessibility to the news in ways that people can understand things in new ways. This is about storytelling, right? So don't forget about the metaverse just because it's not cool anymore. <laughs> you know, we don't walk around with metaverse. It's like very boomer almost to talk about the metaverse, right? So, uh, but I'm just going to flag this and say we're going to talk about it the next couple of years as well. We're going to keep on because it's, that's the thing, the long-term perspective yeah. of these things. So don't get carried away with the hype cycle, right? Yeah. And, and which, of course, a lot of you have a tendency to do because you're journalists and you are you know, reporting on what is happening right now. 
I'd like to open it a bit to the, to the room because I think we have 10 more minutes left, but I'd like to have a, a bit can of a I, conversation I, with, with all of you. Can I ask about you about, because you asked about our future. What is your view of the future? Uh, I, I'm sorry, sorry for you. Well, the, the, the one thing I'm, I, I had a conversation this morning with David Caswell. I don't, I'm not sure if he's in the, in the room, but we, we were also talking about what will be the long-term impact of that generative AI. And certainly, I think there will be some where the, the big brands that can afford to really, the, the power of that data, the power of the AI that's needed, they will win. And you might get interfaces that suck in everything that's beneath, you know, that, news providers become data providers and not so much a destination anymore and then you just become a data provider in somebody else's context and that's something that's, that's, that I see happening and on the other side I, I think there will be a resistance <laughs> some kind of niche that wants to stay out of that context and that will be very much community personality driven very, uh, uh, very much on identity and then there will be a big middle ground where everybody will have to fight for attention and will have to fight the algorithms and the the, the boxes that, that suck you in. So that's maybe a dystopian view of, of what could happen in the future. But very plausible. <laughs> <laughs> very plausible. So with that thought, I, I want to open it to the, to, to the room and see if ah, there's a question there. <laughs> uh, there are people that will be uh, coming around with the microphones. I've heard that you cannot grab it. Uh, <laughs> or at least oh, you get it, the microphone. Hi. Um, I'm Sonia from Slovenia. I'm an editor of an online newspaper for children targeting children 8, 6 to 12. Uh, but my question is not related to this. It's actually related to the future of news. Um, one of the things that I'm thinking about is also that we need to maybe shift the perspective of news media outlets trying to reach to wider audience or either because of subscribe, subscriptions or memberships or basically because of funding. Is anybody thinking actually from the perspective of a reader? For example, if I'm going on Facebook and I want to read one day an article in Economist, one day in La Repubblica, and one day, in, for example, in Chasoris, which is free actually, but I want to support it. Is anybody developing or thinking of developing a single sign-on thing, basically, that would, you know, I mean, I know that it has been done in the past. It was called Chica Chingle in 2009 in America, and not enough media outlets subscribe because, you know, everybody was just thinking of themselves. But this year, I'm hearing here in Perugia a lot of word collaboration, collaboration for journalists and so on. But this could be something, you know, that a media outlet could keep their own subscribers, but got, get also the flybys, like me, for example, because I don't want to buy a, a whole bottle just to get a sip. That's why we're actually working on something like this. And we, it's a play like sip of news, basically, sun, single sign-on. But I'm just interested if anybody's thinking like this, you know, because for me, this is a huge frustration. I really cannot afford to buy a subscription to Economist, support Guardian, I don't know, buy New York Times, Swedish newspapers if I read Swedish or, or Norwegian, you know, or Danish or whatever. And I would love to because... Now I'm not a user who wants one newspaper. I am a global media consumer, basically. Thank you. I just gave a business idea to the room. Um, no, that's, uh, yeah, it's a good question, and it's a, it's a good perspective. It makes me think of uh, Dmitry Shishkin's user needs model and really understanding what the jobs to be done are and what our users now and future uh, users actually want. Um, when it comes to digital innovation and, and kind of prototyping or building future news products, sometimes I feel like we get too stuck on what we can do rather than what we should do. And with everyone kind of crazing for the ChatGPT API and whatever thing comes next, we kind of forget to anchor our experimentation in an actual need. So it might be the need that you just expressed, but it just user needs in general, I think, is it needs to be the starting point. And I think you're right. I think there's a, an audience need there. I'm not so sure how it matches with business models of news providers because you want to be in control of the journey of your user. You want to take them on to your next piece of journalism. And we also get offers from companies that want to take part of our journalism inside another container mixed together with articles of the New York Times and mixed together with articles of the Guardian. We're always very reluctant to, to step into these kind of environments because once you're in there, you don't control the narrative, the journey, the relationship with the audience, and 
makes it difficult. So there's a tension between what an audience might want to and what makes sense from a business perspective. And this is the very problem of innovation and possible futures for journalism that we are very quick to jump to how it hurts our current business model mm. and how hard it's going to be to make money in that future. And I mean, it makes sense uh, we need a business model, uh, but I feel like it's an inherent issue with um, future thinking. I was reading um, Amy Webb's Future Today Institute. They had a report last year called the um, Global Survey on Journalism's Futures. Um, and they were looking at perspectives. What kind of people are decision makers in newsrooms? What are the people who actually decide which of these possible futures we're going to build? And they had a term that was nowists, people who have a short-term perspective. And that was people, um, I think it was 78% of people in news organizations report that they never think more than one year ahead. And the people who were the most nowist were people between 44 and 64, 65. Those were also the people who were the managers, the decision makers. So they're the ones who are going to kill the conversation and say, yeah, cool idea, but where's the business model? And so, we just so, did it here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what we do, we like, overcome that short termism, right? And I would say the, the issue with wall gardens, because that is what's holding this back, right? And that is what is the current business model of most of the companies in here. And I don't believe that is the future. And that will not, I, there are many reasons for that, but we need to rethink the business models mm. of the future. And I don't, I'm not sure that involves wall gardens and paywalls in the sense that they're being made now because that is constraining knowledge into these sort of, that you cannot dip your toes into the knowledge, right, and get that. And that's not actually good for the audiences. And how do we fix that, if it's really the role of journalism to fix that? Next, next, next year's panel. Next year's panel, the future business <laughs> models. How do we get away from wall gardens? Yeah, would love to join in on that. <laughs> I think there's another question there. Yeah, I've one question. Uh, how can you think about the future without panicking? I, I'm from the, from the Netherlands, and in the past I've seen so many media companies really panicking about the future. They felt we should change everything, uh, but we do not know where to start, so let's start with burning money. And that wasn't very helpful. So how can we think about the future of a media company without this panic? So I think that's such a good question, and it makes me think of how, I feel like the future in futures in the media is discussed as something that's happening to us, not something shaped by us. Mm -hmm. So we, we shouldn't be panicked by our own actions. We should be strategic and have a system. But one thing that I um, think can help us not to panic is um, to go away from the current media and social logic of having strong opinions and having strong opinions quickly. Yeah. I think you talked about middle ground. I think what's needed if we actually want to future-proof our newsrooms is pragmatism and it's being clear about that we don't know what future uh, we could have or what, even what we want. We know that there are opportunities, we know that there are risks. Not making our minds up too quickly I think uh, would be one way to not panic. And it comes back to what Ezra talked about and I talked about but is if you're panicking because you're chasing something or you're thinking you have mm. to act and if you, unless you have that values based strategy of what you want to be and how you want to be that, then that's actually a really hopeful view because actually you can create a really clear vision of what you care about and then action that through strategy rather than chasing the latest shiny thing, which is where we've got into this big old mess in the first place. Can I add just a short comment? Absolutely. Collaboration, I think, an openness towards each other because you need to collaborate more than you have ever done before. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really, really important thing as well in order not to panic because then you can actually be even bigger part of co-creating the, the futures, right? I would say. I think we're almost at the end of, of our time. I wanted to see if there's any more questions here, otherwise, I, there. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, question. my name is Barbara, I'm from Germany, and I need a life hack, because uh, I um, facilitate design thinking workshops and innovation workshops, and um, I wonder if you have any tips on how you can um, foster this um, mindset of flexibility in people because I often think this is a big problem and I tried involving futures literacy and um, I wonder if it's possible to to get the knowists on your side and into um, thinking more broadly. Well, it's a difficult one, yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> I think, so what we're trying to do at the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies is when we work a little bit more structured with it, so that, that actually helps 
the Nowists understand it more. If it's too loose and too just, you know, grasp somewhere or too much focusing on the hype now and not connected, you know. So having the tools that, you, that you're all using in the way that you do it, really, and try to make that more explainable uh, for the Nowists, that at least works for us. We work with a lot of Nowists that we're turning into long-term, um, you know, having a long, long-termism, you would say, right? So, um, yeah. but it's, it's, not a, it's not an easy task, and I'm really, I don't have a life hack, do you? Well, I guess just it's not a life hack, but having a shared um, understanding of the problem or the job to be done, mm. a burning platform, if you would, um, at least for us, that's been a way to uh, include Nowists in yep. future work. I hear the people outside, so we'll conclude the session. I want to say future thinking is not so much about uh, what we will do in the future. It's really about what you will do now to prepare for the future. And as much as we think uh, futures, Thank you. as much as we think that the future is about technology, we heard it's very much about connecting with humans. And finally, it's not stuff for experts; it's stuff for all of us. Thank you. Thank you for coming.